for 10.3. We are getting closer to the end of this semester. And for the Take 5, we just sort of reviewed some information about the European map. You guys did a great job. Hopefully, you have a better idea of where you stand in terms of the map, the map and what you need to study. For 10.3, we're going to talk about the Gulf War. Sometimes it's called uh, the Persian Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield. All of those terms suffice. This all starts in the late 1970s when a man by the name of Saddam Hussein becomes the leader of Iraq. He controls his country as a dictator through fear, through intimidation, and he also is in competition with his neighbor, Iran. So during the 1980s, he is at war for almost the entire decade um, and ends up in a great amount of debt. So he decides that the best way to fix that debt would be to look somewhere else in the neighborhood to someone who has a lot of wealth. And he looks to the south to his neighbor, Kuwait. So there you can see Iraq is a very, very large country, um, home of the Tigris and Euphrates River, sort of the Mesopotamia area you, you learn about freshman year. And then Kuwait is that very small territory at the southern tip on the Persian Gulf. Kuwait uh, had a great deal of the world's oil reserves and control of oil wells. So Saddam Hussein decides that if he invades Kuwait, he will then take control of their oil. And he had blamed, he, he sort of, um, he said that he was justified in doing this because Kuwait had been stealing his oil. Uh, and it was very clear to the world that that was absolutely not the case. One issue is that so many refugees had to flee from Kuwait, so that's something that the UN has to deal with. And then also, as the Security Council realizes that this is an incredibly aggressive move by the Iraqi army, uh, the UN Resolution 660 by the Security Council condemns these actions and demands that Saddam Hussein retreat and evacuate Kuwait. Um, what will eventually happen, because as we know, the UN, they can say lots of things, but they don't actually have much power. So it does fall to other countries to then take up this issue and get involved militarily. It will be uh, a U.S. coalition. The U.S. is not the only country involved. Britain, France, Italy, and a number of uh, neighboring Arab countries, Iraq, Syria, and Saudi Arabia there with the green flag. Um, this coalition will work together. They'll be headquartered in Saudi Arabia. And one major concern is how to prevent a heavy loss of life for the ground troops. If you think back just 15 years before this, so 1975, America had evacuated Vietnam because they had been involved there for so long with heavy loss of life and they didn't win. So that memory is still very recent. And the American military commanders want to avoid that. So they take a policy of heavy bombardment. You can see the fighter jets there. Uh, attacking both the Iraqi army and the Iraqi civilians, or at least uh, the cities, to try and force Iraq to surrender. After the fighter, the fighter jets and the bombers had um, disabled the Iraqi army enough, only then would ground troops be sent in. Now, one issue with these coalition forces is they are centered in Saudi Arabia. And as we watched the video we watched in class mentions, uh, Saudi Arabia is home to two, the two most important sites in the Islamic faith, Mecca and Medina. And so there are many uh, Muslims around the world who feel very offended that there are foreign troops on Saudi soil. Uh, part of the reason that the coalition forces were so hesitant to send troops into uh, uh, combat with Iraq is because it had already been known that Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons against his own people and possibly in the Iran-Iraq war. When the coalition forces do sort of fight back after the bombings have ended, we saw in the video that sort of left hook, that surprise attack by General Schwarzkopf. 
catches the uh, Iraqi army off guard, and they actually gladly surrender because they were so tired of being bombarded, and the, their poor treatment in the Iraqi army was definitely worse than how they might be treated as a POW by the Americans. So from start to finish, this conflict only lasted about, uh, about seven months. So end of February 1991, there is a ceasefire. Saddam Hussein was beaten, he's very embarrassed, he's sort of sore about it, but not a huge loss of life compared to what it could have been. So in that way, it was seen as a very successful campaign. However, even though there was the cooperation of all of these different countries, uh, a lot of the Islamic world in the Middle East is upset. Because once again, we have an example of a Western country coming to the area simply for access to oil and protecting themselves. So again, even though we have these countries that cooperated, that were part of the coalition forces, after the fact, they're a little bit bent out of shape. Um, and then on top of that is the religious issue of Muslims feeling offended that there were foreign troops in Saudi Arabia, because from this point on, Americans will have a small military presence in Saudi Arabia. That leads us to the issues with Al-Qaeda, or Al-Qaeda, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, Al-Qaeda is an extremist Muslim group. It was created in the late 80s by, of course, Osama bin Laden. And they never really made any secret whatsoever about what their goals were. They have said, I mean, if they were to give you a brochure, you would go to their homepage, they have said themselves that they're an international terrorist group dedicated to opposing non-Islamic governments with force and violence. So they say right up front, we're going to use these terror tactics, we're going to use violence because we hate the existence of non-Islamic governments and especially the West interfering in the Middle East and with sort of traditionally Islamic countries. Again, like we just said before, part of the reason for this animosity goes back to American military presidents in Saudi Arabia and then also their involvement in Somalia in, uh, on the Horn of Africa. Um, and so just this militant Islam, this extremism that has developed in the last few decades now starts to have a greater impact. Al-Qaeda was, because it's involving this part of the world, Al-Qaeda does help the rebels in Chechnya. Remember we talked about this small group, this small area that belongs to Russia and the growth of Islamic extremism. Remember, Russia had always, has already tried to take over this territory um, back in the 1800s and again more recently in the early 80s with Afghanistan. So from Al-Qaeda's perspective, it would actually be ideal if both Russia and America would end up fighting each other, sort of like the Cold War, and mutually assured destruction. Because then that would, that would ensure that they would eliminate each other and leave this region of the world alone. Osama bin Laden was originally from Saudi Arabia, incredibly wealthy family, almost like a prince. Um, but as he starts to develop these uh, increasingly radical ideas, he becomes a bit of an outsider from his family, and he actually hates what had happened in Saudi Arabia and how it was increasingly con consumed with its own wealth and cooperation with the West. Bin Laden felt that Afghanistan was really the only truly Muslim country left in the world. Uh, part of that is because it really had no formal national government. It was completely organized by clans or by tribes, and he felt that was a more traditional way of functioning. Um, he just was upset about democracy trying to take hold in the region. He hated communism as well. Um, he hated this idea that all Arabic countries should cooperate together. He wanted only Sharia law or this strict Islamic law to be the, the only thing that determines anything. Um, in going to Afghanistan, in, in addition to its sort of uh, traditional, traditional setup, the, the region is very mountainous, uh, very rocky, not a lot of communication, so it was great for setting up these Al-Qaeda training camps. Uh, they're set up in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, and Kenya. And in addition to creating their own camps, they sort of create, I guess you could call them splinter cells or baby camps or satellite camps 
because they want to recruit people to believe this this radical idea and to be a part of their campaign to eliminate these Western threats through terror tactics. All of this is part of what we call jihad or holy war. Um, these these really are radical Muslims. These are not these are not sort of your everyday Muslim who who is a part of a regular community. They are seen as fanatics by much of their own community. Bin Laden was disowned by his family. Um, he was stripped of his Saudi Arabian citizenship because they said he was too extreme, he was too fanatic, he was too violent. Even though Al-Qaeda didn't necessarily like the idea of pan-Arabism, of all these Arabic Islamic countries working together, they do have close ties with uh, other terror organizations like Hezbollah or Hamas that we talked about in relationship to Israel, also with Iran. So we have these different terror organizations and countries connected to terrorism that are cooperating because they all see the West, or especially America, as a shared enemy. So we'll start to see some of this terrorism in different ways. Uh, it's not always related to Al-Qaeda, but it often is. When, this, when we really start to see this um, is in the early 80s, there's a number of attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon. The concept of an embassy is that it is your country's sovereign soil that happens to, happens to be located somewhere else. So this was seen as a real blow to sort of American pride. Um, American citizens are killed in, in each of these attacks. Um, in this case, it was Hezbollah. Uh, the, the terror group from Lebanon. They are uh, all done with car bombs. Excuse me, the first two are car bombs. The last one is a rocket-propelled grenade. And again, they're, they are willing to risk their lives, especially with the car bombs, that they'll drive in and detonate the bomb themselves because they have this extreme belief. And they are, they are inferior to the propagation of this belief. The belief is more important than the individual, and to them it's almost an, it is more of an honor to sacrifice their lives in pursuit of this end goal. Next, in 1993, the World Trade Center is bombed by an Al-Qaeda-trained bomber, Rami Youssef, or Ramzi Youssef, I should say. Um, here we see the World Trade Center in downtown Manhattan. The North Tower, uh, he uses, again, a truck bomb puts it in, it drives it into the uh, the underground parking structure that is part of part of the World Trade Center compound, um, and it detonates on a timer. He ends up being found and put on trial. This attack kills six individuals, and over a thousand are injured with smoke inhalation. So again, we see like, oh, well, they're just crazy Muslims. That was uh, a very popular opinion. There are some people, though who start to see the pattern in realizing that this organization will not stop in its attacks on America. There are more attacks in 1998 on more of our embassies, this time in East Africa. Again, remember some of those Al-Qaeda camps are in East Africa. Especially in Nairobi, this was um, seen as very bold. The American embassy is just across the street from the United Nations embassy. Again, truck bombs are used. Um, they are suicide bombers this time, and both of these attacks were done simultaneously, and it was the eighth anniversary of American troops going into Saudi Arabia. So this clear connection to um, to the the Islamic extremism. Over 200 people are killed, 4,000 people are injured, and as a result, America then rebuilds these embassies with a degree of security that had never, had really not been used before in American construction. Then in 2000, the USS Cole is attacked. It was in port in Yemen. Um, it was refueling, sort of like in the, the boat parking lot. And a small boat pulls up, like a, like a little dinghy almost, or a, um, um, almost like a, a, a rubber blow-up boat that has an outboard motor. Suicide bombers are in it. They pull up next to it, and you can see there the hole. Um, 17 Americans are killed, 40 are injured. And so some people look at this series of events and say, oh, that's so unfortunate. And, and the government and the military really start to take note of al-Qaeda 
and its extreme version of of wanting to eliminate the west and and the freedom that it stands for.